Hello, it's Slim the Stringer, and I'm going to give you a brief tutorial on how to string a tennis racket using this Prince Neos 1000, which is sort of like the industry standard, and I'm stringing a Wilson Pro Staff 97 today. And this is sort of the most basic tutorial I can possibly give, so if you've never string a racket before, this is how you can get started. I hope the camera angle's okay. I had some difficulty setting that up, but you know, you're just starting out. You've never strung a racket before and you want to see something you're looking to get into. All right, so first step is you're going to mount the racket. So on this particular machine, there's a release on the bottom. Let's see if we can find it. It's right here. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull back here and then move this part of the arm in here. And then you wanna find the center, the top of the racket. On most rackets, it's pretty easy. But if you're in doubt, you can count the holes to find the center. In this racket, there's actually a little mark here from other people swinging it and having a mark here. So you wanna find the center here. Then you wanna find the center here. And while you're down here, it's worth seeing the number of holes that are here on the inside of this racket. So we've got six holes. That means we're going to have a loop at the bottom. If we had eight holes, we'd have a, bottom. We'd have a loop at the top. Or if we had four holes, we'd have a loop at the top. But since we have six holes within the throat of the racket, this is called the throat, since we have six holes within here, that means we're going to start at the bottom. And I'll show you what that means once we mount the racket. So, I like to mount the top first. And, especially on this machine, which has a two-point mounting system, one point, two points. And you're just gonna slide it back so it fits not too tight, but tight enough that it can't move. And then, you're going to take this piece, which will come with your machine. And every machine is slightly different in how you mount the racket. But in this particular machine, you take this piece, put it in the little hole here, push it down, and then lock it with this clamp here. And make sure that the little hole here is lined up with the center of the racket that you just found. So. You just found the center and you want to make sure that the hole and therefore this piece of metal that locks it in is right in the center. So you'll see here we have our mark and it lines up with the hole. And then we're going to place this clamp down in here. And now we're locked. And now, you're going to want to take this, lock the length into place, and then give the racket sort of a twist and feel to make sure that it can't move. And it can't move, because if, you, if the racket can move, then you have the possibility of damaging the frame. And that's the last thing you want to do, because tennis rackets are expensive, and if you're swinging for somebody, they're going to be mad at you if you crack their frame, and you don't want to crack your own frame because then you have to buy a new one. All right, so the string that I'm going to be using is Prince Synthetic Goat with Duraflex. This is 17 gauge, this is the thinner version. Uh, they also make a 16 gauge and might, maybe even a 15 gauge, I'm not entirely sure. This is again, kind of an industry standard. Uh, I know a lot of people who the first racket they strung was using Duraflex and it's sort of a really good, really inexpensive string that a lot of people like to put in rackets as beginners and intermediate players. Now, when you get a set, this is a set, they also sell reels. Reels are generally 330 feet or 660 feet. But if you're just starting out, you don't really have the purpose to buy a reel. So this is a set, this is what you buy, you know, from Tennis Warehouse or at your sporting goods store, wherever you might 
by your string and it's enough to do one racket. So one set of string, we'll do one tennis racket. Now, what you will get is sort of a circle of string that looks like this. And this is generally around 40 feet, which you generally on most rackets need around 35 feet. So this should be able to cover 99% of the rackets. There are some really, really over, oversized frames. I remember I used to have a client who strung. He played with a gamma racket and you know I needed to use two sets to string his racket because the head was just so big. But for this 97 square inch head size, this will be perfect. All right, now I need to find my clippers, which I have a habit of leaving in particular places. So, you have your clippers, which is one, some of the tools that you're going to need. Other tools you're going to want, probably, is an awl, just sort of a handle with a metal stick. This one's not very good. Uh, I'm just using it because it's sort of a beginner's tool. The, as you get better, you're going to want to get a more expensive one, which will have a wood handle and a slightly thicker, more tapered shaft here. And be careful because these are a little pointy. And then pliers, just honestly personal preference. Uh, it, I like the ones with the bent nose, but needle nose, just straight needle nose will be fine too. And then I've got an extra all here. The other thing you really might want is a starting clamp, but those are expensive, so I'm not using one today, and are not entirely necessary, but they will make your tension a little bit more accurate and put a little bit less strain on the machine. So you'll see I just cut this little, the little fastener off of the string, and now I'm going to string with the one-piece stringing method used for the entire racket. So that basically means that exactly what it sounds. It means that I'm going to use one piece of string for the whole racket. And what's nice about when you're using a set is you know approximately how much string you have. If, you cut, if you're going from a reel, you're going to have to measure. But I'm assuming that if you're a complete beginner, you're probably not going to go out and buy a reel because especially, you know, a reel of Luxalon Alu Power is close to $300. So odds are you're going to have a small, uh, just a single set of Duraflex like this. This is four dollars from Tennis Warehouse or wherever you get your string. And this is a good string to start with. It's very forgiving and it's fairly inexpensive. So if you break it, it's not really the end of the world. If you break a set of natural gut, say that's that's very pricey. Now, because we know this is about 40 feet. We know that this is going to take about 35 feet. We're going to split the racket up into four sections. So the mains, which are the strings going vertically to the left of the center, the mains to the right of the center, and then the bottom half of the crosses and the top half of the crosses. Now, we're going to want to use one quarter of the string that we have in our set to do one half of the mains. And we're going to use the other three quarters to do the rest. So what I like to do, some people say this is cheating, but I've strung hundreds, maybe thousands of rackets like this, and I've never ever ran into a problem. But what I like to do is I like to take my set and I like to measure out just a quarter of the racket, which 8 feet, 10 feet, between 8 and 10 feet is how much you want. Now, one thing that I've seen people do is they pull across the frame and count. This is, they know that there are 8 strings on this quarter of the racket, so they go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, you want to have enough to tie your knot at the end. So, sort of enough to tie the knot. And then you also are going to need to pull the string, your last string with the gripper. So generally, 
if I'm going to pull out and count the number of the number of strings I'm going to do, it's I'm going to go one over, just because it's also a pain in the neck to have to start over. So you've got in this point I've counted across nine because I have eight here and I have one extra just in case. So I've, I've measured my string. I have approximately ten feet of string here and approximately thirty feet of string here, which is good. And my fingers here are holding the mark and I'm not letting go of where there's ten on one side and thirty on the other. And what I'm going to do is go into the throat. See, we have our six holes down here. And I'm going to pick either one of these, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to pull, put it through the hole. Throw that again. Put it through the hole. These are called grommets, by the way. And then you're going to go to the corresponding hole on the opposite side. So this is one to the left of the post. I'm going one to the left of the post. And this is one to the right of the post. And you'll notice when we pull it across, it'll just be a perfectly straight line across the racket. And then I'm gonna pull it all the way through. And now I still have my marking here. I haven't let go. So I'm using my right hand to measure out the string and my left hand is holding where the middle point is. And now, I'm gonna take one of my clamps. This has bar clamps, so these are the bars, these are the clamps. And I'm gonna clamp that string. And then, I'm gonna know exactly where I am. So now, on this side of my clamp, I have approximately 10 feet. And on this side of my clamp, I have approximately 30 feet. So, I'm going to unwind those, the long part. The we stringers have very technical terms. So this is called the short side, and this is called the long side. And if you are stringing from a reel using the one piece method, the same system works. You can either count across the number of mains and crosses you have, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or you can, if you have, say, a tape measure, you can measure out 10 feet and 30 feet. It's just, it's just a matter of finding where, getting yourself into a situation where you have 10 feet on one side of a marking and 30 feet on another side of a marking. All right, so I've unraveled my long side, which is approximately 30 feet long. I've gotten all the knots out, which is, if you're going to be stringing rackets, you're going to spend a lot of time undoing knots and undoing kinks and string, because it loves to kink, especially if you string natural gut, which I wouldn't recommend starting out on stringing natural gut, because it's expensive and it's a pain, and it breaks somewhat easily, but it's really nice to play with. So, okay, this is the end of my long side, the 30-foot side, and I'm going to go in the hole that is next to where I put in, also in the center, next to where I put my short side in. And then again, go to the corresponding hole on the opposite side, then pull through. And the way that I like to pull is one hand after the other, and that's why most people pull. So with this sort of motion. And Ah, uh, you see, this is interesting. You gotta watch out for this. This string has gotten caught around my clamp, so you're just gonna pull it off. And then release. And now, at the top of my racket, I've got two strings. One of which is my short side, one of which is my long side. This is my short side, this is my long side. Long side's 30 feet, short side 10 feet. Also, just as a side note, this string machine is way too low for me for how tall I am. It's the only way I could get the camera angle to sort of work was to lower it down here. But generally, I like to string with the string bed about up here if I can get it that high, which is difficult because I'm six foot four, so it can be hard to 
get something that high, but that's just because I don't like to be bending over too much. It's not that good for your back. So that's just something to be cognizant of, especially if you're doing 10, 15 rackets in a day, you want to have your machine set up in a situation where you're comfortable. Now the tension. Before you pull your first string, you want to decide or have the person who's racket just tell you how much tension they want. So tension in the US is measured in pounds. It's reference tension, which is not the actual tension that is getting pulled, but it's what we use. So if you go into any tennis push up in the country, you can say, I want a racket string at 55 pounds, and they'll say, perfect. Or you can say, I want a racket string at 62 pounds or 44 pounds or whatever they like. And generally, this is sort of the most basic rule and people argue and get into many debates about tension and tension obviously is affected by the weather and by other factors like humidity. So generally the higher the tension, the more control you have over the ball and the lower tension, the more power you have. So the way that I like to think about it in extreme examples is if you have like just a board, just a wooden board that does not flex at all, and then you bounce a tennis ball on it, you're gonna know exactly where that ball's gonna go. It's gonna go straight back up to you. It's gonna go straight back up to you every time. But it's not gonna go up that with that much power. But if you have a trampoline here, it's gonna catch the ball and it's gonna throw it back at you. So you're gonna have that sort of extra energy coming back from the spring of the trampoline, which the board is just gonna stay solid and it's just gonna bounce off. And, but with the trampoline, it might go a little bit here, it might go a little bit here, it might go a little bit here. And in the concept of the tennis racket, we're talking about very, very minute differences, but that's what you feel on the court. And you know, a couple of pounds can be the difference between hitting a ball this far in and this far out. So it really, it really does make a difference, but tension, that's a separate video. You can watch my video on tension. I don't know if it's been posted yet, but there will be a video on tension. At any rate, we're gonna find our tension. And generally, I think 55 pounds is good. I'm just showing this for demonstration. It's just an old bracket I've had lying around. 55 pounds, that used to be the middle. People are swinging the rackets lower and lower, so now people are saying 50 is the middle. Um, with this kind of string, I'm gonna do 55. Um, that's generally, if people come to me and they say, I want my racket to be swing, I don't know what tension I use, I'll generally do it at 55. Um, uh, so yeah, okay, so now I'm going to take the string that isn't clamped, which coincidentally is my long side. And I'm going to put it in my gripper, right here, like so. And then I'm going to pull back by rotating this. I'll even put the clamp on the other side, so maybe you got a better view. So I got my string that's not clamped. Of course, it is. it does come back around and it's clamped here, but this side is all free. I'm going to take this, slide it in the gripper. I'm gonna, you're going to want to hold it briefly with one hand and then rotate. Keep rotating, keep rotating until it won't let you, it will not let me push it back anymore. It won't let me go in any direction here. So this is, this is locked. And that means that the locking pin, which hopefully you can see that, but this locking pin, this locking pin has popped out. And this string is currently being held at 55 pounds, which is the tension that I set. So I've got it locked here because I'm clamping and then it's pulled, we've got 55 pounds. So now I'm gonna take my other clamp, you always need two clamps, and I'm gonna clamp as close to the grommet or hole as I can. And I'm gonna get right up against it. And this is as close as I can. And then I'm gonna cl clamp down on the string, just like that, and it's locked. And now I can release the tension. And you, you can hear, it's under tension now, and it's locked. And now I'm gonna hold the crank with my right hand, and then with my left hand, I'm gonna release. 
Ta-da. And you'll notice the string is still under tension because it's clamped here and it's clamped here. So it's held in place. And basically, after you do that, just a repetit it's just a matter of repeating the process. So I'm gonna take you work out from the center. So I have my short side here, I have my long side here. I just pulled one of the strings on my long side. I'm gonna pull another string on my long side, so I take the end of my long side. Feed it in here. Come down, straight line. Pull right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And you see we got another knot, right, left, right, left. And one of the important things is that you make sure that you are pulling the string that is on the correct side. I, don't, I wouldn't want to take this string and cross it over. It's an easy mistake to make, especially at the beginning, but that's not, you'll mess up your string job that way. Um, and it will look weird and the tension will be off and you'll probably, and you, you won't be able to finish the racket because the amount of string that you have won't be correct. So now, again, I've pulled, it's locked. The locking pin's out. And I've got, again, 55 pounds of tension on this string. So now, because this is getting pulled, I can release this string. And then, see it releases. And then I'm gonna move down, because the tension was going, it's going this way. And then it's turning around, and then it's going this way. And then it's still being pulled by here. So this is still holding, because this is pulling and this is pulling. And now, I'm going to lock again as close to the grommet as possible. Push in and release. And now I'm going to do one more, also on my long side. when you are locked back here. Lock, release. So you always have something holding the tension on and you can't let go at any point until you've tied your knots because otherwise you'll lose tension on the whole racket. Then you have to start over retensioning your strings. So now I've got here, this is where I started, if you remember, and I have a string going in here. And now I have the other end of the string, which is my short side. And I need to start putting tension on that too. So I'm just gonna take this, crank, locked, release. And then instead of going to a different string, I'm just gonna slide it to the other end. Now, a couple of words on clamps. Generally, if you have a nice swinging machine, there'll be diamond dust tip. Diamond is obviously the hardest substance that there is and it grips really, really well. You don't want these to slip under any circumstances. You're stringing the racket, you want it to have a certain amount of tension on it. You don't want it to slip. The entire time that this is gonna be locked, it's gonna want to be pulling this direction. It's gonna want to be pulling this direction. These clamps are constantly under the stress of combating that. It's difficult though because strings are different widths. This is 17 gauge. I have my clamp set for 17 gauge. There's 18 gauge, which is thinner. There's 19 gauge, which is super thin. I've even seen, I think, Selenko's making a 20 gauge string, which is just like basically dental floss. But on the other end of the spectrum, Babylon's making a 15 gauge string. Lots of people are making 15 gauge string. I've even seen some 14 gauge string. And basically, the smaller the number, the thicker the string, which doesn't make that much sense, but it's how it is. It might be the same for wire, I'm not sure. But, so, this is 17 gauge. And if I were doing 16 gauge, I would wanna loosen. So there's an adjustment wheel right here. I don't know if you can see that. 
but there's an adjustment we want right here. So I want to go lefty loosey to make the clamps a little bit wider. And we're talking, you know, a distance that's visually virtually imperceptible. And making it just a little bit wider. And that's to accommodate the thicker string. And then if we have a thinner string, we're gonna tighten those adjustments and you'd wanna do the same on both clamps and make it so you're just a little bit smaller so the string doesn't slip. You don't want your clamps to be too tight because then they'll damage the string. You don't want them to be too loose because then the string will slip. So it's about, it can be sort of difficult to find that balance in that happy medium. Uh, but generally, you'll have to adjust your clamps fairly often. Uh, and that's just sort of the nature of the, of the beast. Strings have different thicknesses. Strings have different uh, levels of grippiness. So some strings really like to slide out of the grippers and you need to be just a tiny little bit more better clamped down on that. Some strings are really delicate, like natural gut string is very delicate. So you never want to be too tight on your clamps when you're stringing natural gut. Um, but yeah, so when you're working your way out, you never want to do more than three strings ahead of the other. And that's just because there's a lot of pressure on this racket right now. And if I have all of the tension on one side, it's going to not balance out as evenly and it's going to distort the frame. And we don't want to distort the frame. We want to protect the frame through the stringing process. Stringing is generally not the best thing for your frame. You know, the best thing for your frame would be to sit in a 68 degree air conditioned room 24 seven that's at 50% humidity and never gets strung. That wouldn't make for a very good racket because the strings would lose tension, but it wouldn't be under a lot of stress. So, stringing is somewhat not bad, but not the best thing for the racket because it's, it's having to be put under a lot of force. And right now, when it's strung, the force is all even. So we've got force going this way, we've got force going this way, we've got force going this way, and this way. And it all sort of equals out. Right now, we've just got force going this way. So this racket is actually, you can't see it, but it's starting to go outwards, just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, just because of the pressure going in here. All right. And when I do the crosses, they'll come back in just a tiny bit from where its resting position is. And there are people who are, believe that you should string the crosses at a lower tension. There are people that, there, there are lots of theories about how to get the minimum amount of frame distortion. And that's a whole separate topic that if you're a beginner, you really don't have to worry about. Just make sure that you're not going too far ahead of, your, of one side. So I'm gonna do the other, another one here. In the gripper. Sometimes you have to put your thumb back here just to prevent it from sliding because the way the mechanism works is as it goes forward it closes around the string so sometimes you have to push it forward a little bit. Clamp. Pulling, 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 pulling. Pop. It's kind of a satisfying pop. And it locks and you can't move this. And now that we're clamped here we don't need to be clamped here. So we're no longer clamped here. And now that we're reclamped down here, we don't have to be clamped here. And now I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to put the handle back on my side and I'm going to just let you watch the stringing process so you can see how it looks. Because it's just repeating the same steps over and over. It's really what it is until you get to tying your knots. So. And if I'm going too fast, you can always rewind the video. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the comments or feedback. This is my first tattoo video. So if I'm going too fast or going too slow, I would appreciate any feedback anybody who watches this would, would have for me.
So you'll notice here, this is always the center mark, and this is very important. I've got one, two, three, four, five strings to the right, and I've got one, two, three strings to the left. I don't really want to pull any more on this side for fear of distorting the frame. So that means I'm going to go back to working on this side. And you see I'm, I'm all tied up in string. See, I've been stringing since I was a sophomore in high school, and I'm still maybe even a freshman in high school, and I still get tangled up in my string. And yes, there are going to be people who are saying I'm pulling tension too fast. There are going to be people who are saying I'm pulling tension too slow. There's lots of debate among the stringers community because it's very detail-oriented. You meet a lot of really interesting people when you're shooting your rackets. Now I've run into something really interesting, which is the skip holes. Now, every racket has different holes that you skip when you're stringing the mains. And there are a couple of ways to find out which ones are the skip holes. After you do it enough, you can figure it out. Because they're sort of pointing in the wrong direction, and the string spacing will generally be pretty even. So if I were to put a string through here, I would not have a lot of space between these two. If I were to If I were to just go with the next hole like I've been doing, first of all, string would want to come out this way. Second of all, it would be so close to the other string, and that just, just doesn't look right because look, these are all fairly evenly spaced, and then you'd have one like right next to it, and that doesn't look too good. So that's one sign that something's a skip hole. On head rackets, they're marked. It says skip, and on some Prince rackets, they're marked, and maybe even on some Wilson rackets, they might be marked. It's not marked on this. They're sort of going for the cool black and red aesthetic, so they didn't mark it. But if it's not marked and you can't tell by directions or spacing, the other thing you can do is use the internet. The internet is your friend. And if you go on Tennis Express, Tennis Warehouse, or the websites of your manufacturers, Wilson in this case, or Babolat, or Prince or Head or Yonix, whatever they are. I like to go on the I like to go on Tennis Warehouse. Not I'm not sponsored by them or anything. I just the way that they present the stringing information is really good. I haven't gone on them for a while for just for stringing information, but the way that they present it that they present it is really good. And you'll go to the product page of your racket, and you really want to be very careful about the exact model of your racket. Uh, and if you know the year or two, that's great. So this is a Wilson Pro Staff 97. This is not the RF 97. This is the model of racket that Roger Federer plays with. It's a lot heavier. And I believe the stringing instructions for this racket are slightly, slightly different than they are for the regular 97. And also, what's mostly different is the weight because it's the, the RF-97, standing for Roger Federer, is significantly heavier than the regular 97. But some examples of records that I know the string pattern is different from various versions, I know that Babolat's team rackets are strung slightly differently than its tour rackets or its VS rackets. So it's worth looking that up. But at any rate, you'll get on there and at some ways, at some point on the site, it will say skip holes. And it will say 7T and 7H. T stands for throat, H stands for head. So, or whatever the number is. So that for this racket, it would be, and what that is, is that's the number of holes away from the center. 
that you count before you skip. So this is one, this is hole one, hole two, hole three, sorry, hole one H, hole two H, H standing for head, one H, two H, three H, four H, five H, six H, seven H. So this is, you're skipping seven H, you're stringing eight normally, and you're skipping nine H on this one. On the bottom, we're gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven T, eight T is regular, nine T is another skip hole. So there you go. Those are your skip holes, and you have to remember that. And it'll it'll look weird if you string through one of your skip holes, but the reason is that's a place where you're gonna put a cross through. We're working on the mains right now, just as a reminder. The mains are the strings that go vertically from the handle to the racket to the tip, and the crosses are the ones that go across this way. Mains, crosses. All right, back to stringing. So I'm skipping holes. I'm skipping this hole. Just gonna go around it. Just gonna go past it. And here I am. So notice I've skipped this and my string spacing is fairly even. And now we've come to very to something that's really important. And a lot of beginners don't do this, but it's important, so pay attention. So this is, we're after our skip hole, we have our last main. And this record is a 16 by 19 string pattern, meaning that there are 16 mains and 19 crosses. So I know I'm at the end because half of 16 is eight, and I've got on this side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One strings, eight plus eight is 16. So now I've got, this is the end of my short set. See, I've got a lot left over, which is good. Better to have too much left over than too little. And when I tie my knot, which is a difficult part for a lot of people, I'm gonna lose tension. Doesn't matter who you are. The people who string rackets are Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal, they'll lose tension on their knots. So we wanna limit that as much as possible. But in order to counteract that, we're gonna go up on tension. So everything else in this racket is 55 pounds. People say, you know, go up 10%, go up this, go up that. I think I generally just go up five or six pounds, depending on how I'm feeling for the day. I personally don't think it makes that much of a difference because the amount of time that you hit on this last string is. But I think my electronic stringer that I have is set for a 10% increase in tension. But at any rate, I'm at 55, I'm gonna go to 60. One of the weird things about the NEOS is you're gonna turn it left to make the tension go up, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but okay. So we were at 55, we're now at 60. Uh, and don't worry, you don't have to be too accurate here. On the back of the wheel, there's also a a, a more specific number system. So when we're at 55, it says, it, we are at 55 here, which you can tell because 40, 50, 40, 45, 50, 55, the line is are lined up here. And it says zero on the back, but 55 plus one, it's 56. We've got a one back here. We've got a two back here. We've got a three back here. So right now I'm at 57 because I've got 55 plus three back here, so 55, 56, sorry, 58. I was an English major in college. Um, now we're at 60, got the zero back here. And pull, and then again, clamp. close to the ground as possible. And now this is sort of the first really tricky thing. Starting can be tricky, but 
This is the first really tricky thing. So you've got to pick, you, this has to go somewhere, right? Because you can't play with this clamp on. And the goal is to take this clamp off without having to use this. So to do that, we're going to tie a knot. We've got the end of the string here, the end of the short side, and we've got to tie it off on one of the other strings. So generally, there'll be a hole or two at the bottom and at the top that is enlarged. And you can see on this racket, because this racket has been strung a lot, you can see where people have tied off a lot because the holes are kind of getting a little frayed. So here and here, and here and here and here, and here. So, and there. So, what we're gonna do, and hopefully you can see this, is you're gonna go in, and thankfully, you're gonna have two strings go in the same hole. And thankfully, because this racket has been strung a lot, it's really easy to put this string through here. Sometimes, you're gonna have to use your awl to move the other string out of the way, and do so very carefully, because you don't wanna damage the string. Just move the other string out of the way. Sometimes, you'll have to use your pliers to sort of feed it in there. And then you'll see it's coming out the other end. And you'll pull it, because you wanna close up this loop. And now, you're gonna tie your knot. So it's come out, the string has come out. From my perspective, on the left side. And there are multiple knots. Mr. 10S, the number 10S stringer on YouTube has really good knot videos. Uh, knots are not, knots are something that I'm good at doing but not necessarily good at explaining. Um, it's sort of hard to, for me to, to articulate that. But so it's coming out on the left. I'm gonna go under the right. And you see I've got this loop here. And I'm just gonna go around the back, through, and then pull. You wanna pull pretty tight. You gotta hang a lot of tension on this. And I've got one, and always double knot. Some people triple knot. I triple knot when I'm feeling creative. So, the other thing is you come out here, you're gonna go under, from right to left again, and this time you're gonna loop back toward the frame. And that's important. So you see, you've got it coming back toward the frame. That's important because you don't want the tails of your racket sticking out, the tails of your string sticking out, that's not good. Now we've got this here, it's nice and solid, and now we can release our clamp. So this is exciting. The racket is now, I like to call it self-sufficient, as in it's holding its own tension. So there we are. We've got the short side done. So now, it actually, I really like this part because it becomes a little simpler. Now you've only got one string to worry about. Now, One of the people who taught me this string always said to leave this long in case you have to untie it. Uh, I have found that it kind of gets in the way, so I do something which you're not supposed to do, which is cut it right after. Especially if you're a beginner, you probably shouldn't do that. So do as I say, not as I do, but it's just not in the way now. And also for the purposes of demonstration, because I, when I was tying my knot, I came back, you'll notice that it's here, sort of out of the way, and that's about how much you should leave, probably a little bit less, but just so it's sort of as, because I've seen people who leave really long tails and people can get cut just because it's sharp, and you don't want it coming out into the frame. This is basically how you want your knots to look. I've seen some people put uh, nail polish on their knots or super glue or a little bit of paint, just a tiny little bit of very thin paint to seal them, uh, I personally don't think that that's necessary. I think I'm sort of in the camp of stringers that tension loss is inevitable. And everybody will agree that tension loss is inevitable. The moment I finish stringing this racket, the tension is gonna start dropping. Heck, on some of these 
middle ones, the tension already is has dropped because it stretches. And you know, if I give this back to a customer, what are the odds that they're gonna? They might leave it in their car and they'll get hot, and that'll drop. Don't leave your records in your car. But still, I don't know what if I give this back to a customer. I don't know what they're gonna do with it. So tension loss is inevitable. As a stringer, I want to try to reduce that, but putting paint on somebody's strings, which might damage the string, is not something that I've really been a fan of. So, we're, on the other, we're doing the other side. Here we are. We're gonna do the other side. We're gonna get to where we are here. And I don't need to increase tension on the last string. In this case, on this side, because I'm going to be pulling a string that's directly connected to it. I'm not pulling anything that's directly connected to this anymore. So that's why I've got, that's why I increase tension. So I'm going back down to 55. I will oftentimes string this and increase tension just because in the curve you can lose, there's a lot of friction in the curve and you can lose some tension in that and just sort of out of habit, I like to have it somewhat equal. Um, I don't know, maybe it's superstitious, but, and yes, I know it's not, it's not what people who are perfectionists would do, but it's what I do. Okay, so we've got the end. On the other side, we went in through this hole. We tied our knot. Instead, we're going to go to the bottom most of the crosses, which is here. And we're going to go in, and you'll notice this hole is blocked by another string. And this is where you might have to use your awl. I have a feeling I'm not going to have to, but I might. I'm gonna use my all anyway. See how just gently putting it in, we're deflecting the string, we're making there be a place, and then we're gonna pull the all out and stick it through, and we're here. Now, weaving pattern for a tennis rack is very simple. You're gonna do an under, under, over, under, over, under, over, and then the other way, you go over, under, over, under, over, under. It's like weaving a basket. You just sort of alternate and you want sort of a, if you use my fingers as an example, let's see if I'm flexible enough to do this. You want sort of this mesh. Well, I'll just go back it. It's already been strung. You'll notice you've got, on the string, over, under. Over, under, over, under, over, under. And it doesn't matter whether you do over or under first, it just matters that you're alternating. Uh, and then you can look at it from the perspective of the crosses as well. Over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under. Very simple, very simple stuff. It's like basket weaving. Um, so you're going under, you're going over, and now, this part takes the longest to get good at, which is weaving the crosses. And this is where, so it separates the people who can do this really quickly and the people who can't. So you're gonna take your left hand, if you're right-handed, you're gonna go under, I guess you could, yeah. Right hand, your left hand if you're right-handed. I guess that's just how I do it. Some people do it like this. I do it like this. Um, you go under the string bed, right hand, go over the string bed. And you're gonna take the string in between your fingers, like so. And you're just gonna go work it.
pull it under and over through the, through the string bit. And the way to check if you've done this properly is I started with an under here and I finished with an over. So, yeah. Now, got this big loop here. Before I can pull tension, I've got to close it up and get all my string on this side of the racket. Get all my string on this side of the racket. So, a lot of people would think, oh, I'll just pull across here. This is creating a lot of friction. You can already feel this warming up. So what I'm gonna do is, and friction is gonna wear down these strings and it's gonna wear down this string and this bad. So when I'm pulling, I'm gonna push it up and pull it down like this. And it also just makes it a lot easier to go through. Now I got my end. And again, I'm gonna have a blocked hole. Thankfully, again, didn't have to use my awl. I'm gonna go over. And now, I look here. This is an under. This is an over, sorry. So the one directly above it is gonna to need to be an under. And then, here I go. And you notice I'm taking this angle because from the perspective, it makes the spaces between the strings a little bit bigger. And it just makes it a little bit easier. You can go straight across if you want. So now, I've got this string that's clamped. It's coming here. It's going across, and there's a big loop that's coming across here. So I'm gonna pull this string, which is, pull, which is a continuation of this string. I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. And then I can release this clamp. So now, this main is being supported by the fact that this cross is under tension. So now I can do a little one of the traps. And I'll take the other. And I'll put it back on the screen in the machine. Going in the other direction. There are different types of clamps. There are drop weight clamps, there are, which are sort of the, it's like they, they pull two strings and prevent them from going in different directions. Uh, my electronic stringer has bass clamps, which are sort of in the bass and you move them like this. These are draw bar clamps. Uh, they're not the best, they're not the worst. Uh, now the same, they have these teeth so you can fit through the strings, it's all clamps will have these teeth so you can fit through the cross string, the main strings when you're clamping on the crosses. Now, I wanna be as close to this grommet as possible. And then I clamp off and then I release. And now you'll notice I've woven one before, the one that I pulled tension on, and that just makes your string job a little bit easier because of how the strings deflect and move up and down. It's more complicated, but what you, all you need to know is you should weave one before because it makes your job, it makes the actual act of weaving the crosses a lot easier. So now I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. So I close up this gap. finish with an over, I finish with an under here. I have an under here, I have an over here, I have an over here, I have an under here. So everything, it's like a checkerboard. It's perfectly, in checkerboard you have black and then white, black and then white, black and then white. You have under and then over. And I'm gonna pull the one after the one I just wove. So this one, pulling. And now, I can release this clamp because it's coming around this way. It's coming around this way, the tension, the string. Release this clamp that's being held by the fact that there's tension on this string. And now I'm gonna slide over. Clamp next to the frame. And there we go. And now, 
and repeat the process until you get all the way to the top. See, we've got a string caught down here on this, which is the walk to prevent the bass from spinning. This little handle. Come on. And never, never pull the string too hard. You don't want to damage it. Be nice to the string. It's your friend. This is where stringing becomes very therapeutic, especially after you get good at it. Put some good music on, or a podcast, or just do it in silence. I had a mixture of all three. It's nice sometimes. It's just, it's January when I'm recording this, but probably my favorite thing to do, besides listening to music, is listen to baseball while I'm stringing. It's really goes really well. It's a, it's such a relaxing sport in doing this activity. I feel like watching some new baseball on the radio. It feels very American. And I do apologize for the camera work. This is my first sort of foray into YouTube, so again, any advice would be appreciated. I'm hoping to expand to some stringing machine reviews and actually restringing some musical instruments as well. Also, I did skip a little bit of the various parts of the stringing machine. There's a video on my channel called Anatomy of the Stringing Machine, which I'll link in the description. It goes over all the parts, all of the functions, some of the basic tools, everything you need to know about the machine itself. This is also less important because the only thing you really need to know are head, throat, and grommets, and tie-off holes, but I also hope to have a video in the next couple of days called The Anatomy of the Tennis Racket. I'll show you the technical terms for every different, each part of the tennis racket.
So it's really just repeating the same process. Over here. It gets a little bit more finicky when you get closer to the head. But it's not too big of a challenge. to go with weaving. So I'm done waving. I pulled. This is my last string. So what does that mean? Got to go back up to 60. Back up to 60. In the clamp. Pulling. It's always hard to clamp down here. That's as close to the ground as I can get. So I'm glad I've increased my tension. Gonna go through this hole. Go up. To the left of the string, under. To this hole, out. Pull it tight. To the left, under. Back towards the frame. Pull it tight. Then you can release your clamp. Now, taking the rock out of the frame. Release this. Release this. Pull these 
this up. Brackets half ready. And now. One of the things that I like to do is check the valleys, so the low parts, and make sure that they line up. It's hard to get the right camera angle, but you can see. It's hard to get the right camera angle, but you can see they do. And hit it a couple times. After you string a while, you'll get a feel for what string, what tensions feel like what. Uh, that feels like 55 to me. Take your clippers. Don't cut the knot itself, but cut pretty close. It's about what I like to do. And you're done. You just strung your first racket. You're ready to hit the courts. I hope this video was informative. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any feedback for how I could make a better tutorial video, please let me know. And if you like what you see, please subscribe. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.